Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 1 and verse 17 this morning. <clears throat> the apostle addresses the church at Corinth. If there ever was a church in the New Testament that had a lot of problems, it is the church of Corinth. No question about it. And of course, by that, that gives us a lot to preach about, doesn't it? Because the apostle addresses these issues, and this is what comes down to us as Holy Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17. The apostle says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Amen. Father, bless this word now as it goes forth. Our Father, we bless it and we break it as our Lord did. And we ask you to give unction and anointing in thy holy name. Amen. You can be seated. I'm going to preach a message this morning on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, for this cause came I into this world. The apostle Peter rebuked him because he had just told them that he would be delivered to the cross and there he would die. And the Lord Jesus Christ said to Peter, Get thee hence, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things of men. Of course, Peter did not have the spiritual discernment to understand what the real ministry of Christ was all about. But the scripture says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 11, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then as the offense of the cross ceased, the cross is an offensive thing for a lot of people to this day. Ephesians 2.16, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. The apostle says in Philippians 2.8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. In Philippians 3.18, for many walk, of whom I have told you often, now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Well, imagine an enemy of the cross of Christ. Philippians 3.18, for many walk, that, that as I have told you, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Colossians 1.20 says, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Then in Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to, uh, to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And finally, the author of Hebrews says, chapter 12 and verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. All we can do today is conjecture, fantasize, uh, try to think in our mind's eye of what it might have been like for a human being to be nailed to something like that and then to spend days, normally days, on that cross with every kind of thing coming against it, even the birds coming down, pecking their eyeballs out, all kinds of things happening on that cross to endure the insults and the shame, stripped and all that would go with it, the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world not to die in battle, my friend, not to be murdered or killed by the hand of man, but to offer himself up as a sacrifice for our sins. He died on the cross. The cross is something that every one of us has to deal with. It, it is definitely a historical fact. Make no mistake about that. A historical fact. It did happen. So we have to deal with the cross what does the cross mean to us? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to the church of God? What does it mean to religion in general? There are those that like miracles, and they think that the preaching of the Bible is all about preaching miracles. The Bible said in Matthew 4, 23, Jesus went into all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Now, this is a wonderful thing. And I love to see the miracles as they are performed, believe me. And through these years, I have observed firsthand 
many, many miracles. But my dear friend, preaching miracles is not preaching the cross. And my friend, preaching miracles is not preaching the gospel of the grace of God. There is a difference. Matthew 9, 35 said, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So this tells us that we need to study the Bible. What is the gospel of the kingdom? What is the gospel of the grace of God? What is the everlasting gospel that that angel preaches in the book of Revelation? What is Paul talking about when he says, I preach my gospel? And here we go. That's study in the Bible. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter number 2 and verse number 16, they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Some get no further than that. They like the cradle. They like the Lord Jesus as a little baby. And they, go, they want to keep him there. And my friend, that was necessary. For God was ordained to come into this world. And my friend, and become a man as he did. And he certainly did in the book of Luke chapter 2 and verse number 16. But you see, my friend, there's an awful lot of people that the only Jesus they know is the holiday Jesus. That's, too, that's sad. It's the Easter Jesus, the Christmas Jesus, you know, Mother's Day Jesus, the holiday Jesus. Now, these holidays are all fine in their place and in their time. But folks, he's still alive other Sundays too. Amen. Philippians chapter number four and verse number 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things, I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Who said that? The Apostle Paul said that. You see, there are those who preach that uh, you feel good and prosperity, and they brag about their private jets and this, that, this, that, and this, and that. And a lot of people today don't really know any difference. They think, well, isn't that what God wants for us? The Bible teaches plainly that every good thing, every good gift, and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, whom, in whom is no variableness, no shadow of turning. He certainly supplies our needs. He, 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 yes, he does. He sets your table. He puts a roof over your head. He puts clothes on your back. He gives you hands where you can go out and work, a brain where you can think. He makes all these things possible. You have, up to this present point, lived in an affluent nation, a nation where you can make a living, no question about that whatsoever. Now, all you have to do is leave and visit around the world. I did for four years in the military. I saw places that I could, my, that I, there's words could not explain and describe some of the things that I saw that people lived in the kind of places they lived and so forth and so on. But I'm gonna tell you this, the gospel is not about prosperity. The gospel is not about feeling good. The gospel of the grace of God that has to do with the cross of Christ goes much, much deeper than that. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter number five and verse number 21. For it made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What I just read to you is heavy theology, very heavy theology. This rises way above the realm of feel-good religion. What did, I, what did you just read, preacher? I read where God made the Lord Jesus Christ to be sin. I ask, do I understand that? No. Do I believe that? Certainly. But I, in my mind, I wrestle a lot of times. What is he talking about? What sin is he referring to? And you've heard me say it to you a thousand times. But let me tell you what happens. The cross reveals sin. It reveals the wickedness of sin. It reveals the damnation of sin. It reveals the corruption of sin. For someone to have to go and die the way he died on a tree like he did and suffer like he did and bleed and give himself, my dear friend, what he was dying for must certainly be much worse than we could ever think. And I'll tell you this, I've watched it destroy lives. I've watched it, I've watched people commit suicide. I've watched them jump off bridges. I've watched them blow their brains out. I've watched them as they take that first shot of dope and then wind up a drug addict for the rest of their lives. I've watched homes destroyed. I've watched families destroyed. I've watched what sin can do. It will destroy you. It will consume you. It'll leave you a wreck. It'll leave you broken. And this is the culture that you're living in today. So when the Lord Jesus went to the cross, he went to the tree to die for sin and for sinners. Hallelujah to God. The cross reveals the holiness of God. 
The Bible never defines holiness from Genesis to Revelation. How can it? Holiness is the very essence of the Almighty. Holiness is a spiritual thing. He's a part. He's separate. He's there. We're here. And the only way you'll ever go to where he is is by the way of the bridge. And the Lord Jesus Christ is that bridge that connects God with humanity. Amen. There is no other way. You may be a universalist. You may, you may be an ecumenicist. You may believe that all religions are viable. They all believe the same in, in a sense. And they're all going to the same place. My dear friend, there's only one way to the Father. There's only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name but the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the Savior of the world. That's the Savior of mankind. There is no other Savior. He is the only one. So the cross my friend, reveals the holiness of God. The cross reveals the Son. The Bible said in John 15, verse 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Who said that? Our Lord Jesus Christ said it. So what did he do? He proved to them that it wasn't vain, empty words. When he went to that cross, he laid his life down. He said, you don't take it from me. You're not going to kill me. No man's going to kill me. I lay my life down. Yes, he did. He could have come from that tree at any time he chose to. Can I not call 12 legions of angels? Can I not open heaven's gates? Can I not call the army of glory down upon this world? But no, my friend, he went as a lamb to the slaughter. He opened not his mouth. He laid himself down so they could drive those nails in his hands and raise him up and there raise him up before men so that they could see the love of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. There is none other beside him, dear friend. And he proved it when he said, I lay down my life for my friends. This reveals the Son's heart. Luke chapter 23, verse 33. When they were come to the place which is called Calvary, that's Latin, Calvary, a place of a skull. There they crucified him. And the male factors, one on the right hand, the other on the left. Then said, Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. That's the heart of Christ. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. At the right hand of the Father right now, he's saying, Father, forgive them. And by the power of the Holy Ghost of God, he works in the hearts of men. He bought that and paid for it with his precious blood. He has ever right to intercede for mankind. For my dear friend, only one became a man and dwelt among us 2,000 years ago. Feels my pain, suffers my sorrow, gets hungry when I get hungry, gets tired when I get tired, moves his heart when my heart is moved. His soul is moved as my soul. He understands what a man is. And he understands the sufferings and sorrow, the shorts and failings and shortcomings of this world. No one knows it like him. Experiential. He learned it. He learned it by obedience unto the Father. No angel, no cherubim, no seraphim, no spirit being of any kind could ever step and forth and say to the Father, I know how mankind feels. No, you don't. But he does. He does, he does, and it reveals his heart. Aren't you glad that his long suffering got you to that place where that day you said, Lord Jesus, have mercy upon me, save my soul? Do you realize how long that he suffered with the sinner? Do you understand how many times the Lord Jesus, at the hand, my friend, of mercy, that he reaches out from the cross, it's not a hand of judgment. You go to that tree and look up at the one dying on the cross. There's not judgment and damnation and condemnation coming down. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You won't help today. You won't help with your addiction. You won't help from death. You won't help today from your sorrow. Then look to the cross. Look to the one who died on the tree. Raise your hand. He'll put his down. He'll take hold of you at the cross at Calvary. Amen. The cross reveals the giver. Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 32. The Bible said, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God is a giver. 
Oh, what he gave me before I ever knew him. How he protected me. How he opened doors for me. He was with me in every step of my took. He was every breath I breathed. Every tick of my heart. God the Father was there with me from the moment that I came into this world. Until that day I said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save my soul. And he sealed me with the Holy Ghost of God. Amen. God Almighty, my friend, is a giver. He that spared not his own son. How shall he not freely give us? You see, when God gives you something, he doesn't have string, strings attached. You don't have to sign any documents. You don't have to give your blood for it. Amen. You don't have to pledge this, pledge that. He freely gives. This is why he said to his apostles as he sent them out, freely you have received, freely give. Amen. We've been on the radio here for over 40 years in this town. We've offered tapes and all kinds of stuff. And from day one, I said, we will never charge a dime for anything that goes out of this place. If they don't have the money, all they've got to do is ask for it, and we will freely give it to them. And we still do. Amen. And I firmly believe in that. Amen. Freely we have received. I will never make the gospel of Christ. Well, you have to pay to hear the gospel. No, my dear friend, it's free, free, free given it to us we'll give it out to him God has blessed us and he has blessed me and he has blessed this ministry and oh how he has blessed me God's been better to me than anybody <laughs> amen <laughs> amen and I'm sure some of you'd say well now wait a minute preacher <laughs> just about better he's been better to me than anybody you might say but the truth is that's the way you ought to see it you ought to be able to look at, you ought to, you ought to be able to sit down this morning and say, you know what? I don't deserve the goodness of God. I don't deserve what God's done for me. I don't deserve my home. I don't deserve this wife. I don't deserve this husband. I don't deserve these children. God knows I don't. But he's been good to me. He's given me far above and beyond all that I could have ever asked or think. Hallelujah, God. If I died today, I'd die a rich man. Well, I don't have millions of dollars piled up, but I'm going to tell you something. I've got it heaven. Well, the Bible says moth cannot touch it. Thief cannot touch it. I've got treasure laid up there, no question about it. God's been good to me. Amen, amen. So cross reveals the giver. I want you to look at the theology of the cross in the Gospels. What do you mean? Well, the theology of the cross in the Gospels is essentially the declaration of the fact of the cross and that's where it goes and that's fine that's fine for you the new testament is to be understood chronologically in other words is it revealed as it is revealed by time a progressive revelation throughout the new testament scriptures the apostle paul is the one that the lord chose to reveal the preaching of the cross in its doctrine in its theology for example he said the cross was foolishness to them that perish. He said it's a stumbling block. He said it's an offense. The apostle Paul talked much about the blood of the cross. Amen. The apostle said in a way we cannot understand God being in Christ. And no, we can't. Can you understand that? God was in Christ reconciling the world into himself. And more than one time in the New Testament, it talks about God reconciling the world unto himself. He's the one that reached out first. He's the one that made that move. And he still looks at Satan. And he looks at him as he sits at that chess table. And he says, you move. Amen. And if you really want to get a hold of God, you ought to get down on your knees this morning and say, I wonder what he's up to. Amen. Don't take some simplistic, religious explanation for the mind of an almighty, absolute, eternal being that is from everlasting to everlasting, that made man in his own image, that had a reason for bringing us into existence. I did so many things before 1973 that I deserve to go to hell for, you wouldn't believe. There's no way in the world that I'd get up in front of people and tell you all the stuff that I did. But in 1973, a big hand reached down from heaven and boy, did he ever touch my soul. Now, if you're sitting here today and you're an agnostic, you're an atheist, you're this, you're that, and you've never had an encounter with God, and you're saying to yourself, well, preacher, that's good for you. That's, you know, relativism. If that works for you, fine. Now, well, let me tell you something. If it's real, it's real. It don't make any difference if you believe it or not. But here's the thing. He loves you. 
He died for you. And when God gets ready, he'll get your attention. The other day I went to my basement. Preachers carry things on them. And sometimes a spirit will come upon one. And man, when they do, I know, the, I know them. I know them. I know when one comes in. I know it. You can feel the dread. You can feel the pressure. You can feel that thing as it comes down upon you. Well, I got down in the basement and I started talking to God. And when I tell you I talk to God, I talk to God. I didn't tell God what I thought I wanted him to hear. I didn't talk to God in some high-sounding theological way. I didn't talk to God, you know, where I was afraid that I might make him mad. No. Have you ever talked to God and got real with him about what's going on inside your soul? Have you ever really done that? Well, then what happened? He talked back to you. He might not have at that moment. He did at that moment for me. But he talked back at that moment. He answered that spirit that had come upon me and he gave me light that I needed in the ministry. And when he did, God bless your soul, that thing lifted. <laughs> it lifted and it left that room. <laughs> and I came out of there and I knew God had heard me. Now, if that won't fire you up and that won't do something for your faith, I don't know what will. That'll do something for you. Preacher, you telling me that I mean to, that you want me to just get down there with him and just talk about, yes, yes. Quit this religious garbage. Quit trying to impress God. You can't impress him. And let me, let me give you this warning, please. How many of you believe that he already knows what's deep down inside that heart? I'm glad you do. Since he already knows what's deep down inside that heart, what he essentially wants you to do is to acknowledge it, come clean, and come to a point where there's a meeting of minds. You see, you know what's going on. God knows what's going on. Let's get it settled. Have you ever had a controversy with God? Well, you've been mad at God. Yeah, like Jeremiah said, I'm done with him. I'm finished. That's what he said, to paraphrase it. He said, ever since I started preaching his word, all I've had is trouble. These people, they, they, they mock me, they spit at me. What in the world did you call me in here to do this for? I'm done, Jeremiah said. All right, son, close your Bible, walk away. Oh, you'll make God mad. He'll make God mad. He found a place where he could talk to God. You see, there was something inside Jeremiah he didn't know was in there. And that's what you gotta find out as a Christian. Jeremiah said, oh, I thought I could shut up, but his word was in my bones as a burning fire. Oh, I couldn't stay quiet. It ate me alive. Then you know what a God-called preacher is like. If you're a young man, and you feel like God's called you to preach, you get up and you bring a message or whatever you want to call it a few times, and, but for some reason it just, there's just nothing in there. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not going to shame you for that, for somebody who wants to do something for the Lord, and you do it, and you find out, well, maybe necessarily that's not what God wants me to do. That's okay. This is what the Bible means when it says, make your calling and election sure. Put it to the test. You want to teach? Did God give you the ability to teach? You want to preach? Did God call you to preach? And here's the simple fact. If you can shut the Bible, walk away and quit preaching, go get you a good job. Come to church, raise your family, serve the Lord, live for God. You say, preacher, won't God get mad at me? No, if he didn't call you to preach, he's not going to get mad at you. But if he did call you to preach... You can go to all the churches on this earth. You can do everything under the sun you think you can do to please God. But you'll never be satisfied until you get down on your knees and say, Oh God, I can't run far enough. I can't run fast enough. I cannot get away from this calling. Then good, preach. <laughs> now I'm an old timer from the old school. And there are people in this town and they think, well, there is no specific call to preach. 
Yeah, that's what's killing us now. We've been lectured to death and there's no, there's no soul in it. There's no passion in it. Amen. Amen. I've already told him I've got it settled with the Lord. I've, I've already got it, I've, I've got it taken care of. I've done preventive maintenance. <laughs> so what is it? I've got it figured. I've got it taken care of the Lord. And Lord, when you get done with me and I can't preach anymore, you know, and, I, and I, can't, I can't get up here and do it anymore, take me out of this place because I can't see myself not preaching. Are you following me? I hope you are. Because what I just gave you is over 40 years of experience of prayer, talking to God. Don't, don't go around confused. Don't go around hating mad at God. Don't go around uh, with Satan beating you to death and lying to you. The Lord wants to talk to you and the Lord will deal with that issue. But you've got to get real with him and quit trying to cover up something and you know you can't cover it. Talk to him. Now before the sun goes down tonight, I may find myself somewhere, in some room, somewhere. I don't know. Something may come upon me. Something may confront me. Some issue. Something, whatever. I don't know. I don't know what, I don't know what a day brings forth, but I know this. I'll only, bear, I'll, only, I'll only let that spirit beat me to death so long. I mean, after all, you know, one more night with the frogs, we do get to where we get, we, we get, we get used to getting kicked around by, by a spirit. But I'll take that thing somewhere, and I'll get me in a hole somewhere, and I'll get a hold of God somewhere, and I'll get that thing off of me, and I know how to do it. There's only one way to do it. Get a hold of God. You say, well, I can't get a hold of him. That's because you don't go deep enough. Why don't, you, why, don't you, why, don't you frust, why don't you cry out in frustration and say, why aren't you listening to me? Why don't you do that? Why don't you, why don't you, why don't you say to God, where you at? Why don't you hear me? I've confessed every sin I know to confess. Why don't you listen to me? Where are you? Oh, preacher. Oh, you're going to make God mad. No, 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 no. That's when the Lord's going to say, well, she's, she, he, whichever one it is, finally beginning to get hold of some truth here because they're frustrated now and they really want an answer. I don't know if you followed me. I don't know if you got anything from what I said this morning. But what I gave you is real, folks. Amen. What I gave you is real. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Well, we'll come on down here and we'll close with this one. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 23 and verse number 5. Deuteronomy 23, 5. Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. He's cursed. You think there's anybody out there trying to curse you? You think there's anybody out there like see you fall? There are people that go to church every Sunday. Every time the doors are open. They may not be your friend. That's right. They may not. You mean to tell me, preacher, that somebody's trying to call a curse down on me? Read this text. Deuteronomy 23, 5. Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken to Balaam, but the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee, because the Lord thy God loved thee. You see, he can turn a curse into a blessing. Look at that tree. Look at that man hanging on that cross. Look at that horrible spectacle. Isn't that something? That's a curse. That's cursed. Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. That you touch that cross, you touch that curse in faith, and you'll be blessed. Amen. That's the way God does it. You cannot curse what God has blessed. Genesis 50, verse 20. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it into good to bring to pass it as it is this day to save much people alive. Joseph was one of the finest men that ever lived. He had, he had an attitude. He had a demeanor about him. that he, was, he should have been the king. He was a king. Joseph was a mighty man. He, he was head and shoulders. They, they were, they were, when, the, when his brethren came before him, they looked at each other and they, they groveled around in guilt because they knew what they'd done. But not Joseph. Did he condemn them in it? No, he forgave them. He blessed them. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Joseph had the power of a king on him. And of course, he is a type of our Lord Jesus. There's two types of Christ in the Old Testament that have to do with his Messiahship. 
Joseph is the one that represents Christ as the suffering Messiah. All right? David is the, is the type that represents Christ as the ruling Messiah. Right? The Jews try to answer the Messiah with one coming. When he comes, he'll be this. But the truth of the matter is, he's already come. All right? And at the first coming, he came as Joseph, the suffering Messiah. When the Lord Jesus comes now, the second time, he'll come as David, the reigning Messiah. And then both lines of prophecy will merge when he comes and sits down in Jerusalem and reigns with a rod of iron for a thousand years. And he will do that. He certainly will, surely as you live. I encourage you this morning, talk to God. You can go to people who want to help you, and that's all fine. Get them to pray for you. That's good. That's a good thing. That's absolutely good. Get together with, with people and have a prayer meeting. That's all a wonderful thing. But, folks, nothing will take the place of you getting down inside your soul and your spirit and really opening up with God about what's going on in here. If you've got a controversy with him, bring it out. He knows it's in there already. Bring it out and let the minds meet. And let him start talking to you. You talk to him. Do you? So are you mad at God? Was your faith, you know, I, I, I've seen, oh boy, have I seen things. My, you ever seen a little casket that long? You ever seen a little box, a casket, box about that long? Yeah. All right. And then there was another one about like this. I've been to the graveyard more than one time with just a little, little, little uh, babies just born. Maybe live a few days, a few hours. You know, people could get mad. They could, they could really turn on God. They could blame him. But by the grace of God, they didn't. And then God took that and sweetened heaven. Because the one that, the little body that was in that box right there, they're going to see her one day, or him. And what a thing heaven's going to be. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Father, bless your word. Thank you for this time, in thy holy name. Your head's bowed, nobody looking. Anybody say, Preacher Lawson, God spoke to me this morning. What you're saying is true. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid to open up. I really am. I'm afraid God's going to get mad at me, and he won't. No, 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 no. It's not as easy to make God mad as you think it is. He knows us. He knows what makes us tick. I'll tell you what turns him away is hypocrisy, lying, deceit. When you try to hide something in your heart and think God doesn't know it there, are you kidding? Are you kidding? So what's going on inside you? You don't have to tell me. You don't have to tell a man. Tell the Lord. Talk to him. Open up with it. And he will restore your prayer life. Because something like that can hinder your prayer life. It can. And if you're, if you're not praying, if you're not praying, folks, your fellowship, you're not in fellowship. You can't have fellowship without prayer. And if you're not in fellowship, your sins are going to eat you up. Your heads are bowed. Anybody raise your hand and say, Preacher Lawson, don't you pray for me this morning because, oh, God bless you. Hands going up everywhere here now. Amen. Well, God bless every one of you. God bless all of you. I'm not your judge. I'm not up here to judge you. Good night. I'm a preacher. I'm a minister, a bishop. My job is to get the word out. So if something's going on inside your soul, I want you to talk to the Lord about it. Anybody else, raise your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me. Well, God bless you over here. There's another hand. God bless you. Well, the hand's going up everywhere. Hand, God bless every one of you. Amen. Amen. Lord, help my unbelief. I didn't expect as many hands to go up like did. Thank God for it. It just shows the Holy Ghost is working. Amen. Anybody else? God bless you over here. Hand there and hands back here. Hallelujah. Father, you see these hands. Lord, I'm just the messenger. That's all I am. You know that. That's all I claim to be. That's all I want to be. Father, bless them. Move in their heart. Move in their heart and in their soul and bring them to that place, Lord, where they meet with you and they meet with you on honest ground and they meet with you where they can communicate and you can talk to them and they can talk to you. Father, I pray for them. I pray in Jesus' name because I know that is the only way they're going to get help is when they're willing to do that. In thy name I pray. Amen.